So thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to be here. I was here in person in 2017. It was a great event, really enjoyed it. So thank you for the opportunity again to speak. Um, so uh, if you know about me, you might know about me through the venues that were already discussed. I co-founder of Stack Overflow. I've been a longtime blogger and my current project is Discourse, which is that uh, icon in the middle. And this talk is kind of about failing because I've always been a little bit obsessed with failure to the point that when I launch projects, I tell people, uh, I don't know if this is gonna work. This might not work. I don't, I don't know what's gonna happen. And um, that's always in, in the back of my mind. And I can prove it because if, notice the date on this post. This is a post from a forum still out there, you can Google it, you can find this, this forum thread if you want to. And you notice it's in 2008, and it's me uh, talking about how I'm basically gonna build Stack Overflow. And I mentioned, uh, I, I don't know if it's gonna work. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I, I like to build this way, and I wanna talk a little bit about why I like to build this way and why I think it has so much power, um, because normally you, you talk about success, right? So if you haven't seen Stack Overflow, I'm sure you have. This is Stack Overflow. I thought I'd show it to you in Russian just to make it a little more exciting. There are localized versions of Stack Overflow out there. I think Japanese and Russian are the, are the big ones, uh, but there you have it. And really what I'm saying is that success is boring. There's a lot of talks, a lot of people that'll come on stage and tell you, you know, oh, look at all the great things I've done. Look at all the great things that we've achieved. And I'm here to tell you that's boring. Success is, is boring. It's, it's not interesting. That's not the thing you want to focus on. Um, and this famous Tolstoy quote, which you'll see in so many different presentations, but I love it because it, it's true. Uh, it's saying the same thing I'm saying, which is success is just not that interesting. It's it's yeah okay things are going great. You're you're very successful. You're 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 everything's humming along. You're you're rich. Good good for you. Great. Um, but what about everybody else? You know what about other stuff? Um, and a lot of success really is luck. That's the thing. You know it's it's not that I was so talented and and I made this happen. It's like well you happen to be in the right place, the right time. You did a few things and you know you. Uh, you had a great outcome. That's great. But you got to acknowledge a lot of this is luck. A lot of this is really just being in the right place at the right time. So Will Wright, who's a famous software developer, he built SimCity. He built a lot of really, really well-known games, uh, an icon in the gaming industry, says one of his key hiring questions is to ask someone not, tell me about all the great things you've done, but tell me about the things you worked on that failed. And here's a guy who has built games you've definitely played. <laughs> the Sims, some City, Spore. I mean, he's a he's a world-renowned game developer. Um, and that's where learning comes from. It doesn't come from success. Learning comes from failure. Learning comes from the thousand times that you tried and it didn't work. That's where you learn. You know, it's it's hard to learn from success. It's 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 much more useful to learn from failure. So with this in mind, you might think about um, surgeons like surgeons you don't want surgeons to fail like failure is bad if you're a surgeon because you know it's literally life or death a lot of our software isn't which is great but if you're a surgeon that's bad so uh there was a process where they studied surgeons why why are surgeons some surgeons uh successful why why are some surgeons not successful and this turned out to be the key question if you wanted to find out if a surgeon was going to be successful you would say have you ever made a mistake and if so what was your worst mistake and the ones who said, oh, I don't really make mistakes, or I had a mistake, but it wasn't my fault, those were the bad surgeons. Those were the surgeons that had low success rates. The surgeons who answered, oh gosh, I make mistakes all the time, you know, and geez, this thing the other day that happened to me, I just, I totally screwed it up. Those were the good surgeons. They were the, they had the ability to think about what they had done and improve it based on their failures. That's, that's the key to being a great surgeon, ironically. And if you haven't seen this, this graph, this picture, I, I hope you have. Um, I love this picture because what it illustrates is World War II bombers that came back, they analyzed damage in World War II of the bombers that came back to learn how to make better airplanes. You know, where should we reinforce the airplane? Where should we add armor? And if you look at this graph, you think, oh, gee, look at all the damage. We want to add armor where all the damage is. See, that's the problem. Uh, you're looking at 
success data. You're looking at bombers that made it back. The bombers that made it back are fine. They don't need armor in those areas. They need armor in the other areas. So success can, you know, failure is interesting in a way that success is not, right? You didn't get to see the crashed planes. All you got to see was the ones who made it back. What you really wanted to see was the ones that didn't make it back, but you don't get to, right? So that's why you have to really th seek out the failure and people hide it. It's like, well, I failed, but I don't want to talk about it because, you know, that makes me feel bad. Like I failed. It's terrible. And I'm saying, no, um, you want to be obsessed with failure. You want to be like, yes, I failed. Good. <laughs> Um, but in a very particular way. So let me talk about the three ways. So first, in the industry as a whole. So in the software industry, how do you get the benefit of failing without trying to fail? And you know, nobody sets out to fail. That's a ridiculous goal to have. Uh, we do this thing called a postmortem. It's a little bit morbid, but it literally means you know after death. And it documents how we all make the same mistakes over and over. We we constantly do this, right? Like that, that's, that's a problem. And the book Bad Blood is a great example of this. Theranos, fantastic story. There's an HBO series, not quite as good as the book in my opinion. So definitely check out the book. It will blow you away. Like the things that happened at Theranos are insane, uh, but it's a good example of failure. Uh, uh, very high profile failure. There's also a book collection of, of, and I like, video games because video games to me are really hard because you're trying to optimize for fun you're using really advanced tech you gotta you know be on the cutting edge and it's really really difficult kind of software development in my opinion that's one of the hardest kinds um and there's a lot of different games that you can look at postmortems of teams that were trying to build these games and some of them worked some of them didn't some of these are famous you may recognize and it's what I call the Gilligan's Island phenomenon, where this is an old show. I'm getting so old now that my references have to be explained. This is a show that I would watch as a kid. And it's castaways. They're stuck on this island. And every week, they try to get off the island. They have some crazy scheme to get off the island. But they always fail. Hence the show. They're stuck on this island forever. <laughs> um, and so here's, you know, they're, they're, they're thinking, like, how do we get off this island? How do we escape this, this plight that we're in? And they're always stuck, right? But they keep trying, you know, they keep trying. Every week they try a new thing to get off the island. That's the entire premise of the show. And that's kind of how we look at software development. And there's this sort of classic mistakes that you make. And one of them is in this book, The Mythical Man Month. This is one, one of the mistakes you make in software development, but it's a really common one. Um, it's adding people thinking, well, my project is going slowly. So if I add a person, that'll speed things up. And it's like, well, actually, no, that will slow your project down. Uh, that's a classic mistake. This book is one of the mistakes. There's lots of mistakes, okay? So I'm not gonna read this list, uh, but you wanna review the list of common mistakes in the industry and say, am I making these? As a person who runs a project, every day you should be, well, not every day, but every week, look at this list and think, am I, am I doing this? Am I falling into this common failure pattern that lots of other projects have failed with? And you should say, look, I want to make mistakes, but I want to make really good mistakes, like new ones. No one has ever failed in this way before spectacular, right? Like a new failure no one's ever seen before. That should be your goal. Um, which brings me to the HBO show Ch Chernobyl. One of the best things I've seen in the last five years, maybe one of the best things I've seen in my entire life. I would actually rank the show like top five all time things I've ever seen. It's a fantastic thing and it's based on a real incident. It's mostly correct. They take a few liberties. Um, and Chernobyl, of course, is, is, a, is, is a big nuclear accident. And it's the first time that happened on earth. It was <laughs> literally the first time. Uh, and the funny thing, well, maybe funny is not the right word. The strange thing about it is it happened during a safety check. So a safety check actually triggered Chernobyl, uh, which is kind of ironic. And it truly was unique to the planet. Like this had never happened before. And it, that that's the kind of what, the way I want you to think about failure. Like think, can we create a spectacular failure no one has seen before? It sounds bad, but that actually should be your goal because you don't want to fall into the common mistakes. So 
look at the past failures on your team. So number two, one is the industry. Think about industry common failure patterns in the industry. Now think about your own failures, right? This is where you start looking at your own team, your own projects, yourself actually. Um, and the show does this. It actually starts in the past, right? Like it's like, it, it, it's in out of order. So you wanna go back and in discourse, which the software I currently build, we have a, 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 catag a, a, a tag called postmortem. You can see it at the upper left there. This is looking all categories, things tagged postmortem. Every time there's a big enough failure event, little tiny failures we don't document, but it, a, a failure of significance, we document, it's important. That's part of our routine is to understand our failures by writing them down. And we make a timeline. We start with, well, this is when it started. Here's all the things that happened. So step one is to enumerate, like what happened? Like, you know, and, and you know, one critical metric here is how long did it take you to even figure out what was happening? Like a bad thing was happening, but what? How fast can you figure that out? That is a type of optimization that you wanna be really good at. You wanna be really good at seeing why things failed uh, quickly, like diagnosing them quickly. Um, and how can we fix it even faster the next time? That's the, the bigger picture goal, right? Like what are we gonna change as a result of this failure? So the next time something like this happens, we can solve it even faster. Um, and just writing things down. Honestly, it, what I showed you was just us writing things down. Like, well, here's what happened. We, well, there's some formatting to it. We just tell the story of what happened. That's it, that's all you gotta do. Just make sure you write it down. So think about failure, write it down. And remember, it's stressful. Failures are like, you know, stuff is going down, right? Like literally stuff is going down. It's frantic, but you gotta take notes. You gotta have someone or someone on your team, we call it the scribe, taking notes and making sure they, they are documenting everything that's happening because it's hard and you might miss it. You might have an event and like everybody's running around so frenziedly, like no one wrote down the notes that we needed to understand this event. So bear that in mind. And in the show, they do a fantastic job. Chernobyl document, figuring out what happened is like the, the process of going through and talking to so many people, writing it down and getting everyone's perspective. And at the end, she plops this huge pile. This is a, a sort of a character that's an uh, aggregation of a bunch of scientists. This character represents a bunch of Russian scientists who all did this work. She plops down this set of journals like this is what I found. This is what happened. This is what, what, what did. Uh, and also bear in mind, like, don't make it worse because <laughs> it's stressful again. And you, as you're running around, you might be yelling at people. You might be like, how, you know, we're down. This is terrible. Our customers are, you know, it's, it's you know, don't, don't make it worse. There's a great character in Chernobyl <laughs> who does this, uh, the sort of the, the, the boss at Chernobyl who's on duty at the time makes things a lot worse because he's like, no, this isn't happening. This didn't happen. This can't happen. And they're like, wait, it did happen. He's like, nope, didn't happen. Don't believe you. And he wasn't open to it. He was actually making things worse. Uh, it's sort of a parody meme now. Like this is a, a red radiation burn representation of him saying, oh, three, 3.6 wrench and it's, it's not great. It's not terrible. Uh, but actually the device was pegged. Like that was as high as it would go. Uh, that's what he wasn't thinking of. So hence the joke, kind of a, you know, a very Russian dark joke, but that's, that's a Russian joke for you. Um, and you don't want to be the person who's answering everything like, oh, you know, I, I got it. I you know, ask a lot of questions like, what's happening? Who's on it? Why did this happen? Why did this happen? Why, you know, and, and the five whys. You want to be asking a ton of questions. And that can be part of the stuff you write down. It's like, well, you know, what happened here? Why, where did we go here? So that's your failures. So consider the industry, common failure patterns. Look at your own past failures. You will have postmortems, right? Because you're writing things down because you understand how to do postmortems and you're practicing this as a team. You all have those to look at. Now you need to think about how are we going to fail in the future that we haven't failed yet? This is where, this is the art. Right, this is where it gets tricky. Um, there's a great quote. There's so many beautiful quotes in Chernobyl. It's such an amazing show. Why worry about something that isn't gonna happen? Oh, that's perfect. They should put that on our money. And God, this scene is so powerful. Uh, I can't do it justice, but this is about predicting the future, worrying about things that 
shouldn't happen, but might. Um, and then safety system checks. And I mentioned Chernobyl was the result of a safety system check. The safety system check triggered the problem. Um, but that being said, you still should be doing regular safety system checks. What does that look like on your team, on your software, in your process? What does a safety check look like? And it can take a lot of different forms. Uh, one thing we do at Discourse, this is our GitHub. We're an open source project. You could go there right now, discourse slash discourse. Uh, every time someone checks in code, we run a series of smoke tests to make sure that discourse is still functioning, still producing output in a browser, right? Um, and, you know, unit tests, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of tests run uh, to make sure the code is still functioning as we expect it to. So there's a lot of stuff you can do that that's automated, like automate the checks, right? All the free automation check you can do, you absolutely should be doing as, as a best practice just in general, and that's standard industry practice. Uh, so here is uh, the build test, right? So every time you check in code to discourse, we actually run all those tests on it. Oh, and by the way, every time you check code into discourse, you can do this right now. You could go to GitHub, literally edit a text file. You will trigger all the tests. You will trigger the smoke test. You will trigger the JavaScript headless browser check, and you will cause code to be deployed to meta.discourse.org right now today. So meta.discourse.org is the site we use to support discourse. So when it's down, believe me, we notice <laughs> because it's part of our daily routine. We go there, that's how we support our own software. And it's deployed every time there's a check-in of any kind. Uh, so that's another way to think about this. Uh, so here's some, some logs, so when things, aren't going right, we actually create topics. So this is, again, trying to predict the future. Oh, geez, our logging rate is really high. Oh gosh, Puppet isn't running, that might be bad. So there's a lot of like, what ifs you can kind of automate, like things that haven't gone wrong yet, but might, let's run checks for that. Um, so this is this is what you're seeing is the alerts category. If, the, if you look at the upper right, it says alerts, and it's in red, <laughs> an appropriate color for alerts, and saying here's all our current alerts. These are topics that are automatically generated in discourse based on uh, monitoring what's happening. Um, we also have an external check. This is Pingdom. We switch, sit, have switched to Status Cake now, but it's all kind of the same thing. It's like from the outside world, are your websites still actually there? And define what actually there means. Is it, does it return HTML? Great. Uh, does it actually, does it have JavaScript errors on the page? Are there visual rendering errors? I mean, it could be a style sheet error that makes the whole site unusable, right? It's technically functioning, but all the text could be upside down, right? For all you know. So again, you gotta decide what, what functioning actually means and what you should be checking for. So this is just sort of rudimentary um, HTML checks, a very low level, but an important level. And you gotta have a lot of these levels to check. There's this great movie, Charlie Victor Romeo. It was a play originally, and it is intense. Um, what it is, is it's a replay of black boxes. So these are boxes on an airplane that record everything that happens and they're super hardened. So if the plane doesn't make it, the black box does. And the black box records everything that's happening on the plane, all the instrumentation, all the voice chatter, all the control head settings and headings. And these are actors replaying what was on the voice recorders. And most of these planes didn't make it. Uh, but it's really instructive to think about the instrumentation you need to, to have to understand like, well, why did this happen so we can fix it so this doesn't happen again, even if it was human error, right? And you're going to hear them working through the problem. You're going to hear them trying to figure out what's happening in real time. And it is a, a tough watch, but important because aviation is incredibly safe. Like statistically, the risk of someone dying from an airplane crash is unbelievably low. Like, like driving your car is so much more risky than flying in a plane, like I think orders of magnitude. And this is why, because they take this stuff so seriously and they're monitoring everything that's happening and analyzing it in the case of the failures. 
So in Discourse, we also do sort of black box instrumentation, and this ships with every version of Discourse. If you go to, you look at the URL there, it's dev.discourse.org slash logs. If you install Discourse, you get slash logs. It's our custom UI that says, hey, here's all the errors we've encountered in Discourse. There's various levels, there's warning, there's fatal. Um, and it's a really great tool and we contributed it back to the community. Um, it's called Logster and a lot of the logging is paid logging in Ruby world, unfortunately, but this is free. We didn't like that. We're like, no, this needs to be free. This kind of black box instrumentation must be available, available to everyone because it is so critical. So as a site owner, you have access to your own kind of black box. So like, well, geez, what went wrong on my site, on the server side and also on the client side? Um, so Logster is a great tool. So you got to think about what am I monitoring? Which, you know, again, if you're monitoring, you're logging, you're generating graphs. And some of the graphs can be really instructive, you know, like just to look at them and say, well, geez, the trend here, nothing bad is happening now, but the trend is bad, right? Like if we continue at this rate, I mean, you know, terrible things are going to happen. This is the number of queued jobs you're seeing we really don't want this many jobs in the queue because that means the queue is not being cleared. Uh, and that way we can fix it before it becomes a problem. That's the magic, right? We, know, we, we saw the trend, intervened, and did not have a problem as a result. That's the goal. So that is what we're sort of getting to here. And that's what Chernobyl was about, is like, how do we fix this, not just for us, but for everyone? So this never happens to us again. Uh, that's what they ultimately got to. And Chernobyl, the final moments are so fascinating. I don't want to ruin it for you, but the whole story is about figuring out what happened and the engineering that goes into figuring out what happened. That's the, the, the goal, to make it so this doesn't happen for anyone ever again, not just our team, but as an, as an industry, you know, for, for all software developers, for anyone building software, how can we make things better? And the type of reactor Chernobyl is, has flaws. It's a flawed design. And they went back and fixed those flaws finally, after much, much prodding. Um, a lot of prodding watch Chernobyl and you'll see how intense it gets, very Russian. <laughs> um, there are still some operational reactors that are the same style as Chernobyl that have some of the same risks that they've kind of mitigated, but it's still there. And so that's what I want you to think about is, you know, at the industry level, where do we typically fail? How do, how do, do post-mortems on your own team and look at your own failures and say, well, geez, you know, how can we do better? And then also think about predicting the future. I know it's hard, but like, how can we plan to fail and avoid those situations that cause us to fail? And how do we get better as an industry? Like that, that to me is the most noble goal we have is to build better for, for ourselves and for everyone. And even the current pandemic, we're going to be better at the next one, right? We, we have amazing vaccines based on a very novel type of vaccine generation. Uh, viruses aren't going away and we'll get better at this. This failure will make us better. And that's the goal. Thank you very much. I hope this talk was useful to you. And I think I'll do some Q&A now. I don't know if there's time, um, but that's, that's my talk.